Congressman Peter Roscom is chairman of the Ways and Means uh, Subcommittee on Tax Policy. Welcome, Congressman. And I'll send it over to you, Bob. Thank you. Hey. Good morning. Hey. Good to see you. Hey. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, please. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so the big question is, when are we going to see legislation on tax reform? Soon and very soon. <laughs> this month? So the... Uh, um, Clearly, there's got to be a budget resolution that, that, that is settled and done. And mm -hmm. as Chairman Brady has described this, you need a runway and, and a sense of clarity. Right. Then I think what you'll see is the committee move with dispatch at that point. I don't think that there's going to be a lot of time between, between that um, and the announcement of the chairman's mark. And will, will there be, uh, Congressman Neal was saying we, we sh there should be hearings, but Will there be hearings? Uh, do you think that there should be hearings, or has this been debated enough uh, over the years that, uh, that you can move right to a markup? I think you can move right to a markup. I don't think that there's going to be any concept here that, that is going to be present in this discussion or in, this, in a chairman's mark that, that we haven't you know, really had a, a good discussion about in the past. Um, when border adjustment was on the table, mm -hmm. we had a, a hearing on border adjustment. You could make an argument that that's a new concept. But with the jettisoning of border adjustment, I think it's reasonable to say, look, we, we all basically know how these, um, everybody knows these basic concepts. There have been, you know, if, if you're a you know, first time caller, long time listener of the Ways and Means Committee, you know that uh, beginning in the camp era, continuing under Ryan and now under Chairman Brady, this incredibly robust hearing schedule on all things tax reform. So I think, I think it's ripe. What do you see, just uh, generally speaking, for, for the timeline? Obviously, the, the House is, is further along than the, than the Senate. Uh, do you see a uh, regular order here that goes to markup, Ways and Means Committee uh, approves it? And when do you see the full House voting on it and then kicking it over to the Senate? I don't know. So I can't give you a straight answer in terms of a a, a date certain, but you can imagine um, budget resolution is is taken care of. Committee moves to you know the announcement of a chairman's mark. There's a dis a, a, a discussion and pretty robust debate all the way around. But it, you know at some point you've got to say, let's go, let's mm -hmm. let's have the markup and let's move forward. So um, the in all likelihood the House will move first, just based on the. Uh, the necessity under the Constitution and the disposition of the institution itself. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, and you've spoken pu publicly about this, there's been concerns about eliminating the state and local uh, tax deduction. Uh, will that be in there, or could it be phased in so that it, it uh, allays your concerns and, and the concerns of, of Republicans from New York and California, where you, know, you add them up. There's a there's a lot of Republicans from yeah, those that's two right. states. So here's the here's the state of play on this. There's a sensitivity here, obviously. So I'm from suburban Chicago. It's a high tax jurisdiction, and you know the notion of tax reform simply redistributing a tax liability from one geography to another that's not tax reform. So you've got uh, members of Congress from Illinois, California, New Jersey, and New York in particular that are raising this issue. And I think what the chairman is trying to do is figure out wh where is the soft landing here? And I think uh, as I've had a discussion with members from other high tax states, this was my appeal to them. And it's pretty straightforward. Evaluate any tax proposal in its totality. So look at all the benefits and, um, and make a decision from there. Give us time to work as a committee to try and get feedback to, uh, to accommodate you on this. And I think when it's all said and done, I think we'll end in a good place. I'll tell you, it's not for the faint of heart. I mean, this is an issue that hits very, very close to home for a lot of people for all the obvious reasons. But I'm, if, it, if, it, uh, if it weren't state and local, it would be something else. So, you know, rub some dirt on it. We'll figure it out. And I think we'll, we'll navigate through and come to a good resolution. And a fair amount of Republicans, and you included, voted for the budget resolution. So were there concerns raised at that point? And that, listen, we're going to work something out on this. So you can, you can vote for the budget because we're, we're not going to just ram something through. That obviously, a lot of these Republicans are in, are in districts that Hillary Clinton win or are, are swing districts. Uh, but that's, that's a real sensitivity right there, just election-wise, that it could be used as a campaign weapon. 
So during the camp days, I, I uh, observed a focus group, a series of focus groups on tax reform of the camp draft. These were really, really interesting. And the focus groups had a consistent theme that I observed, that, that the people who were part of the focus group were willing to come and they were willing to sit and listen to the totality of a presentation before making a decision about what their view was. That's interesting. Said another way, they didn't come in with an attitude of, I need to protect this particular thing or I need to protect that particular thing. The general public's disposition was, show me. Show me the whole, the, the, the whole package and I'll make a decision based on the totality of the package. And I think that when it all is said and done, that's gonna be the level of evaluation that the public's gonna have and I think that's the level of evaluation that members are gonna have. Now similarly, when we had this off-campus meeting, what was it, a week or so ago, and it was a discussion of the, the framework with, within the House GOP. I've been in a lot of these meetings in the past, and a lot of these meetings in the past, and the, you know everything that you read about them is all true, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so they, they tend to end up in acrimony, recrimination, and admonition and finger pointing. A lot of these meetings don't end well. This, the disposition of this meeting was entirely different and it was very refreshing. The disposition of this meeting was that members when they were coming to the mic after the presentations were critiquing, commenting, observing, offering um, real suggestions and, and insight. Remember there's a lot of smart people who know a lot about taxes who don't serve on the Ways and Means Committee. And so the committee itself is well served to seek that input. And it was very much of a disposition of members that were forward leaning. In other words, their attitude was, I, am, I, I'm, I anticipate voting in favor of this. Will you make this as good as possible so it's easy for me to vote in favor of it? As opposed to, you know, this, the passive aggressive, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying no, but I'm really saying no, and there's nothing that you can put in this that's ever going to induce me to move for it. Very different feeling all the way around, and I was encouraged by it. Why do you think that is? I mean, is, is it partially because that while the House passed uh, a health care bill, the Senate did not, but that, I mean, I've talked to some Republicans who are like, this is, number one, it's got to get done for the economy, but number two, we have to go back to our constituents and say, we accomplished something big, and this would be big. This would be big, and I think there's a couple of factors. There's, I think there's a longing for uh, the part of a lot of members to restore confidence in institutions. And the Congress is not well perceived right now, and the ability for Congress to come forward and do something significant that has an impact on the daily lives of our constituents is something that uh, people are really interested in. So said another way, members of Congress are ready to go home and hear people say, good job, well done. And they've not heard that in a long time. That's the first thing. Second thing is, I think there's a number of members of Congress that recognize that we are in the midst of an historic debate as it relates to our, our economy itself. Such an, easy, it, such an interesting thing that the economic historians are going to have a field day with us in 50 years because they're gonna look back on this season right now and say there's basically two competing views of the economy that are being presented right now to the American public. And they're, they're wrestling with one another. There's one view of the economy which I reject and that view of the economy says that the economy is a fixed pie that if somebody does better, it comes at someone else's expense. It's pretty dark and it doesn't end well, but there's a lot of people that, that believe that and are propagating that. On the other side, there's those of us who say it's not a fixed pie and that if somebody does well, that's good for all of us and so forth. Now, that's not to be cavalier about the distributional questions and the ability for people to participate in a growing economy, but the latter view, that is the expanding pie, is more in sync with the American public than the I want their stuff view of the economy. And here's the proof of that. Americans are delightful people. And one of the reasons that we're delightful and we're charming is that when people have been successful around us, we tend to say, how nice for you. And the reason we tend to say how nice for you is, we think that could be me, that could be my daughter, that could be my grandson. And we all know many people who have come, you know, if, 
if uh, you know material success is your thing, we all know a lot of folks that have come from incredibly modest backgrounds to wild success within a generation or half a generation or whatever. That is uniquely American in a lot of ways. Now, they're competing, these two views. And if, you're, if, if millennials, for example, are being told, you're stuck in your station in life, and there's no way you can get out of your station in life unless there's some federal program that comes over the hilltop and pulls you out, I would suggest our future is very different. It's not to dump on federal programs, but you get the point that I'm, that I'm driving at here. There is a worldview that is really being articulated, and it's being articulated in our tax code. And I think a lot of members of Congress realize that this is a generational debate that we're having, and that's why it's so significant. Do you think that when the final package is out and done, that you will be able to pick off some Democrats? You know, there's some concern that this could go similar to health care, where you have a couple Republican senators or, or three, and, and they reject it and they have all the power, that, that you're going to need some red state Democrats. Remember, John McCain voted against the 2001 Bush tax cuts. Now, obviously, he cast a deciding vote on health care. So do you think, you, obviously, you're not going to get most Democrats, uh, because there's going to be enormous pressure from Democratic leaders, but do you think you can pick off some, whether that's Blue Dogs, uh, Colin Peterson, back the 2001 tax cuts? I think so, and I think there's a, there's a couple of things. There's a, a dynamic that I'm observing um, with, with and, and this is as an observer of the Democratic Party, it's not obviously as a participant, so I don't know what it's like on the inside. But there's a group of Democrats who are simply oppositional. If Donald Trump is for it, I have to be against it. And, and you see that, it's, that's as plain as day. There's others who are far more nuanced and I would argue more sophisticated than that, and they've got the capacity to be more discerning. And our hope is to create a tax reform package with input from them uh, that will essentially is an offer they can't refuse when it all comes down to mm -hmm. it. That they'll say, look, um, regardless of, of whose, whose name is, um, you know, whose imprimatur is, is on this package, this is something that's going to have a direct impact on my constituents. It's a good impact. And therefore, we're, we're uh, likely to move in, in favor of it. What, how important is permanency, whether it's on the corporate tax rate? And uh, will, you, will a lot of these tax cuts, uh, number one, be paid for and be permanent? So this is an area where we're, we're, we're not going to do as well as we had hoped in terms of permanence. It's, it's obvious. Is permanent better? Absolutely, for all the obvious reasons. Are we going to be able to get to a completely permanent change? I don't think so. I think we're going to fall short of that. So is this an all or nothing proposition? No, it's not an all or nothing proposition. Let's try and make as much permanent as we possibly can and recognize that we're going to have to come back and, and do other things in the future. So some of us have, have described this as, as, as once in a generation tax reform which is true. There's also, it creates kind of a false impression, though, that this is, this is where tax reform starts and ends and that there's no, other, there's no other activity moving forward. So I think we've got to be communicating that um, let's, let's get in as much permanent as we possibly can and recognize that there's going to still be more work to do, obviously. Uh, the plan now would drop the top tax rate to 35%, but then there's a caveat of, well, a fourth tax bracket could be added. Is that just negotiating possibly down the road that at least this is a flexible plan that you could add? That? What's that going to depend on, whether you add that fourth tax bracket? You mean the fourth tax bracket on the individual yes. side? Um, I think it's going to largely depend on revenues. So there's been a few, a few uh, bright lines that have come from the White House. One bright line is no higher than 20% on the corporate rate perfectly reasonable. The second is get the pass-through rate no higher than 25%, perfectly reasonable. Third red line or bright line is drive as much middle income tax relief as is possible. So that's going to be the nature of that mm -hmm. discussion. What does that look like? How does it score? Um, if, you, if you have a fourth rate, do you keep it at 39.6? Do you drop it at some number between 39.6 and 35? And what's the revenue gap that you need to fill so it's, it's very much um, a, a point of discussion all, all across the spectrum. Um, critics of, uh, and including some Republicans, said that the message on health care this year, there just really wasn't one. Uh, what is going to be, you mentioned the middle class, the Democrats have already gone after the plan as a tax cut for the rich. So what is the, the message that you're telling people who are not 
junkies like all of us in the, in, in the audience and insiders, but that, that you're hammering home and, and with the help of the president, uh, is it focused on the middle class and what they will get from this plan? That's really the focus, but it, um, it's, it's beyond simply a, a rate cut. So think about the, um, think about sort of the slow moving nature of economic growth and begin to think about what it would be like if we're not stuck at that 2% range, but what does 3% look like in terms of growth? That takes your breath away, and the buoyancy of that and the opportunity that it means is something that's, that's incredibly attract attractive. There's a different dynamic, too, with taxes than with health care, and this is the difference. In the health care debate, there were defenders of the status quo, strong defenders of the status quo. In tax policy, there's nobody, and I mean no single individual in the United States of America ever is going to say, oh, the Internal Revenue Code? I love that thing. Just leave it the way it is. <laughs> nobody likes the IRS either. Um, and and go, back, go back to the economic historians and set aside the debate zero sum versus um, open economy and just look at all the things that have changed since the last time the code was updated. The entire internet has developed as a commercial enterprise since then. We've got a tax code that, that, that predates that. The global nature of supply chains, similarly, far more interlinked. Um, the, uh, the, the shared economy, Airbnb, Uber, Lyft, all those things weren't even contemplated at a time when the, the tax code was last put in place. So it creates a fundamentally different dynamic. So it will be communicated in ways to different constituencies to highlight advantages and so forth. But I think it's, it is such an interesting thing is in that there is no defender of the status quo, which one of the ways I'm going to frame the debate is, all right, you're, if, to oppose this is in a way to defend the status quo. Because this is really going to be the best thing we're going to be able to move. So would, do we defend the status quo of the health of, of, of the tax code, or do we want to move to something new? We are going to open it up for questions. So uh, we have one question right there. If you can identify yourself and ask your question. Hi, uh, Kayla Gowdy with the Job Creators Network. Um, can you speak to how you guys landed at the 25% pass-through entity rate versus the original proposed 15% or even an equal 20% uh, to C corporations? So the thinking went like this, to try and reduce C-Corps and pass-throughs down by the same proportion. And, there's, and, and, and if you do that and you get it as, as, as low as you can, that's where you end up. You end up at 20 for C-Corps and 25 for pass-throughs. So the pass-through dynamic is new. So I represent a constituency in suburban Chicago, and there's a lot of pass-through entities. And I know this is true across the country. I'm just, I just can... Uh, I'm, I'm always reminded of how many of these smaller companies I represent in my constituency. And when I go to them and say, we want to try and get your business income down to 25% within, uh, within that pass-through, they're very, very encouraged by that. But that's a little bit of the, of, of the measuring. Everybody would like to get it as low as, as, as is possible, and we think that that's the sweet spot. Question over here. Yes, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John Bird with the Business Coalition for Fair Competition. To dovetail on Bob's question about permanence, wanted to commend you and Mr. Kine on your bipartisan bill, the Free File Permanence Act. And another angle to unfair government competition where there's a tax policy is the unrelated business income tax, or UBIT. Can you touch upon uh, the inclusion or strengthening of UBIT in the Republican plan and potentially as a pay for for? Your, your role's big plan. Thank you mean you. UBIT on the nonprofit side in particular? Correct. Um, so, no, I won't touch on that uh, because I don't think that there's, there hasn't been a lot of discussion about it. I'm not trying to be cavalier about it. There hasn't been a lot of discussion um, on that so far. But you can imagine over the next two or three weeks where the, as, as we're looking for pay-fors and so forth, there's uh, a, a disposition to be more forward-leaning on some of these sorts of things. So uh, a, a proposal that may not be particularly attractive at the very beginning of a tax reform process suddenly becomes a lot more attractive given the alternative. We're now entering the stage of choose the red pill or choose the blue pill, and that we're going to be navigating through on that basis. Question in the middle. 
Hi, uh, Ben Colton, Beacon Policy Advisors. Uh, Senator Bob Corker had uh, the number of $4 trillion for pay force as kind of like a magic number to get to. Do you guys on the House side have a, a certain number that you're looking for to raise revenue? Is $4 trillion uh, a reasonable number? So all these things are interactive. And the, the question is, uh, pay, the, the interaction of how do, you score, how do you score dynamically? What's that number? What's the number as it relates to current policy versus current law? And then what are the pay-fors that you need uh, to fill the gap? And what's your tolerance for debt? Th those, those are the factors, essentially, that all need to be navigated through. So we're going to be driven by what's the, what's the number of the budget resolution, and that's the number that we're going to key in on. Uh, one quick question on uh, the Affordable Care Act. Do you think that, that the House will do anything on a bipartisan basis, or is really just you know, you pass your bill and the Senate is, they've had some bipartisan talks that, that they would lead on anything that could be a bipartisan fix to the Affordable Care Act? My instinct is this, that the House has done its work and the Senate needs to do its work. So whether its work is moving uh, and, and refreshing another opportunity at Graham-Cassidy or if it's you know, the, the bipartisan work, Alexander Murray and so forth. But the Senate needs to come up with a product that then the House can conference with. It is not likely, in my view, that the, the House would say, you know what, let's, let's, let's take another run at that and let's send something else over to the Senate. I just mm -hmm. don't think that's likely. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what about the cooperation between uh, Congress and the White House right now, just behind the scenes? Are, uh, is, is the administration engaged, and what do you need from the president to use the bully pulpit to pass this bill? So I'll give you that answer by taking you back to a conversation. When I first got on the Ways and Means Committee, tax reform was in the air as it's always in the air. And I thought to get some advice and counsel from the person who knew the most about this from my point of view, that was James Baker of James Baker fame. So I, uh, he was generous with me. and spent some time on the phone with me and kind of walked me through chapter and verse of their role in 1986. But he said something that at the end of the phone conversation that I will share with you because it made such a strong impression on me. He said, Peter, remember, this was Ronald Reagan's number one domestic priority of his second term. He used everything he had as Ronald Reagan. We used every tool we had at the White House. We used every tool we had at the Treasury Department. And we had powerful advocates on Capitol Hill, and it collapsed three times, and it almost didn't happen. Say, good luck. Go, see ya. <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> so the, um, the White House, I think, has been incredibly helpful. Um, Director Cohn, Secretary Mnuchin, you know, they, they recognize this is an all-hands-on-deck situation. And the president has a unique capacity to, uh, to, to, to drive a debate based on the bully pulpit and so forth. And I think you will continue to see that, um, that level of coordination. So said another way, you can't do this without the administration being enthusiastic and, um, uh, and, and incredibly engaged, and they've been willing to do that. So you're going to get this done? I think we're going to get this done, absolutely. I am... Um, I think that when push comes to shove, we're going to reflect back. And I think net, net, re set the tax policy aside. I think the public will breathe a, just kind of breath of a relief, just take a breath saying, oh, my goodness, this institution is able to get something done. And I think there's a sensitivity on the part of a lot of members to say they're really longing for that. And so I am uh, quite confident it's going to get done. Well, thank you for joining us. Please thank Chairman Roskam. And I'll hand it over thank to Thank you Hannah. very much.